Good evening. Welcome to Ron's Rambling. This will be number 10, which is part two of the study of Noah, one of the heroes in the roll call of the faithful that we find in Hebrews chapter 11. As we closed part one last time, we had just seen that a conservative estimate of what the world's population may have been in 1656 at at the, after the creation, 1,656 years after the creation. Uh, that population, would, if we figured accurately, uh, is at least double what the current world's population is. Uh, it's not just the few thousand that a lot of folks think of when they think, are looking at, that, at the scriptures and and considering what it was like before the flood. Unfortunately, though, practically all of those 17 billion people, if that's how many there was, had pretty much dismissed God from their lives. Uh, they had become totally corrupt, and their way of life is one that was to benefit them regardless. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans near the end of chapter 1, he says, For what can be known about God is plain, because God himself has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature has been understood and observed by what he made. Those people were living witnesses of what he had made. And yet, uh, the people in the pre-flood period had quit looking toward God. Instead, they were seeking what was good for them. They were living long and prosperous lives, and they had left their creator. They enjoyed, though, what he had created. Knowing the, the physical world looked much different than it does today, it's difficult for many to imagine. And the understanding of it is not easy because the flood completely wiped out the world as it existed then and changed it into what it is now. We're familiar with our planet uh, as it now exists. We've learned from classrooms, from our own travels and discussions with, with others who have traveled, uh, many educational uh, and science programs from public television, as well as, as videos and photographs from the space missions uh, and astronomy. And what we've learned about our planet and through all of those varied avenues is that with the exception of the slow, uh, subtle changes that happen due to weather or erosion or man in some instances, essentially it still looks the same today as it has looked for centuries. And regardless of whether someone shows us a, a global view of it or a photograph from a space station or even a map image, uh, we easily recognize Earth as being our planet. But what if I told you that the Earth has not always looked the way it looks now? I'm not talking about those subtle changes that we spoke of a while ago. I'm talking about greater changes, much greater changes, even greater than earthquakes and, and catastrophes and flooding and fire. Uh, I'm talking about a complete geographical change that not only produced a completely different configuration of the world, and I'm talking about a physical configuration of the world, but it also caused a very pronounced change in the ecosystem so that human life 
was also changed because of it. Depicted on this slide is the way the ancient Hebrew thought the world looked. Keep in mind that back at that time, most people thought the world was flat. So their view would naturally be skewed by their beliefs. However, they knew what God had revealed in the first few verses of, of chapter, uh, first few chapters of Genesis. Their view shows us that they understood what God meant. They understood God's word, but they applied those understandings to their, their flat world that they had considered all along. They thought the earth was supported by huge columns. I don't know where those columns rested or what they rested upon. Uh, and they don't show that, so I suspect they didn't know either. But that's what they thought. And they knew that the ocean was surrounded by a tremendously large ocean. It's almost as if the whole world was a little island that was floating uh, in that ocean. They were familiar with what Genesis describes, though, because they have the elements, uh, the stars, the sun, the moon. They have the water around the earth. They have the water above the earth. Uh, I think they're mistaken about the rock ceiling that they have put up there with floodgates so that God can allow water to come through whenever he needed it was necessary. But all in all, that is not a bad uh, image of what the world may have looked like, uh, except for the fact that it's flat. And I think we all agree that, that the earth isn't flat. And, and by the way, uh, that view is not held only by ancient Hebrews. Uh, I copied this image from a virtual creation museum called Genesis Park. You might want to check out their website. It's, it's a pretty nifty thing. But it depicts what some scientists have pondered for years. According to them, there is far more evidence that leads to the conclusion that a different but yet unified world existed before the flood. In that world, they say, there were no individual continents like we have today, but rather uh, all of the continents that we have today were, were connected or at least extremely close together. Uh, many of those scientists believe that a person uh, could walk from one continent to the other because they were so close. Uh, others say, no, they were a little further apart than that, but a person with a canoe could have easily gotten from one continent to the other. Other than, than believing in the scriptures, they also came to the understanding by two reasons. One, by carefully looking at the uh, existence of the various land masses that exist today uh, by surveying the lands and getting accurate uh, photographs of it from space and and all of the things that it takes to make it necessary or it make them able to produce uh, a good figure they believed that all of the continents if they were shifted and a few of them rotated slightly, uh, would fit together like a puzzle because the shapes are so closely uh, familiar to each other. That is the continent, the two continents or three continents or four. They, they look like a, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and if you can just configure them rightly, uh, you, you can come up with a single landmass, which is what they thought existed, a single landmass. 
uh, and using that information, they did uh, rearrange some of those continents to form one landmass, and that's what they're showing in in this image. It's called a, a Pangaea, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, the definition of that word, by the way, means it's a supercontinent that incorporates all of the land masses of the Earth. And so this image shows a global view that is very similar to what the ancient Hebrews uh, believed, uh, but this one's global where theirs was flat. Notice that they incorporate the water that's all around uh, the landmass. They also incorporate the water that's above the atmosphere, uh, although they show it as a narrow band of water, and most of them, I'm talking about the scientists now, they think that that upper band of water may have been water vapor. Uh, I'm not sure I could go along with that because we're going to see maybe in part two, uh, three or four uh, where that doesn't seem likely. However, uh, that's what they, what they think. Uh, frankly, I don't care too much for their picture, but it, it caused me to think. And so I decided to put my Photoshop skills to work, and I made, it, made my own pang, Pangea, if you will. Uh, it, it took me quite a while to do that, and everything doesn't fit together perfectly, but neither did theirs. And maybe I should have put Antarctica and Australia at the top and rotated them so that they fit down uh, easily between the North American continent uh, and the Asian continent. But, uh, or I could have moved it over to the east further and slid it under Russia and, and China, uh, maybe Australia under one, and, and uh, you can understand what I'm talking about just to, to get all of them together. Uh, but regardless of how it looks, whether you like theirs better than mine or mine better than theirs, uh, the idea of one large landmass and all the oceans being together to form one big water uh, more closely agrees with what is said in the first few verses of Genesis. Uh, I said there were two reasons for scientists to believe that the Pangrea is correct, uh, and that's because of the tectonic plates that exist. This, this slide shows the Earth's tectonic plates, and they have been rearranged as had the land in the slide before us uh, in such a fashion that they fit together like a puzzle. But the interesting thing is, when you're looking at the tectonic, te tectonic plates, uh, those things are deeply embedded in the, in the core of the earth, not the core, but deeply embedded in, in the uh, earth, the crust. And, and as, uh, apparently, as things get uh, deeper, they expand. That is to say, those plates get larger. And so you can see in, in this particular drawing, the, the tectonic plates fit very well together. And as we'll see later on, uh, the scientists believe, th those scientists who believe in creation, they believe that those tectonic plates shifted when during the flood and to, to where they are today, or closely to where they are today. Uh, and, and that makes things much more agreeable to them. <clears throat> Interestingly, to me at least, in, in 1912, I think, there was a scientist named Alfred Wegener, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, 
And he theorized that the surface of the earth is comprised of sections that share attributes. Uh, now, he didn't know to call them tectonic plates, but that's what he's actually describing. And he said that uh, uh, those things shift. Now, that was back in 1912. Well, beginning in 1950, a good number of scientists carried his idea further, and they determined that continents do move around on the planet, still are moving. It is called the continental drift. That's one name for it. I don't know if there's, there's others. But listen to this. Between 1996 and 2019, they have tracked the continent of Australia, and it has moved, I'm talking about the, the, an exact point, uh, a landmark on the continent of Australia, uh, and they got the GPS coordinates of that landmark uh, back in 1950. And they did it again in, 19, in 2019, last year. And they found out that the, the whole continent of Australia has shifted, has moved 4.9 feet toward the northeast. Now, 4.9 feet is not a big deal. But it shows that those tectonic plates are shifting. And there is truth into that uh, continental drift that we were talking about. And so some scientists are saying that it's not at all unusual to, to think that in an event as severe as described in the, the flood in, in the book of Genesis, that it would have caused a complete shift in all of those Teutonic plates so that what was once a closely knitted world where the landmass was all essentially one great big mass uh, so that it shifted to more be more like what it is today. And let's take a closer look at that and see. In order to do that, I'm going to have to move me from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side. So let me get that done, and then we'll shift to, to another slide. Genesis 1, verse 1. Now we're going to look closely at what the scriptures say and see if we can't see some of the things that, are, that have been described and will be described as we go on. Uh, Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The beginning, as it is detailed in the book of Genesis, provides us the true details about creation because it's directly from the Creator Himself. It's the inspired Word of God. The truth is there. It's up to us then to accept that truth for what it is and to understand that before creation there was nothing and God said something is, in, is going to be, that he is going to create something and that something existed. It came into existence. Uh, that idea is hard for for a lot of people to believe. It's, it's just, uh, there's something about it that's just too difficult for some folks. I can only say this. If a person believes in God and believes that the Bible is God's word, then we must believe that the Bible provides the truth. So let's do our part. If we believe in the Bible and in God, 
and we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then the Bible is God's Word that He spoke to us so that we might know. And so the first two things that God created are heaven and earth. Now, those words are not plural. They're singular. One heaven and one earth. Uh, it kind of tends to want us to think of that one big landmass, doesn't it? But I want to show you so that you understand better. The Hebrew word that is rendered heaven, if I'm pronouncing it correctly and quite honestly, I, I'm i not a Hebrew speaker, so uh, this may not be right, but I think it sounds something like Shameh. Uh, the English spelling of it is S-H-A-M-E-H. And the literal meaning of that is lofty or a loft. Now, remember, this is for heaven. This is the Hebrew word for heaven. And it means a loft. It's not talking about the sky, as some think it does. It's not talking about even higher than that, the, the, the ether, ether that is out there. God is, what God is saying is actually pretty simple. He's saying before there was nothing, and now there's something. The something is Shalmei, and that is a, a, a space, if you will, that God created so that he can put everything else in that space. Now, I'm not talking about the global earth. I'm talking about everything. That includes our entire solar system and whatever lies beyond that. This is a vast space that God created. And it simply says God created the heaven and the earth. If we believe the Bible, then we must believe that. So we have that that vast space. Now, nothing has been created to fill it yet, but it's there. And then the next thing he says is the earth. The Hebrew word that is rendered earth is Eretz. And the literal meaning for that word is firmness or the firm. Again, it's not talking about the earth as we know it, because that comes later. At the very beginning, it is simply a firm mass that now exists in the, in the space that used to be nothing, but now is something. As you know, as we go through creation, uh, God's going to create all of the heavenly bodies. And, and we'll be told about those. But right now, that's just empty space that's sitting there waiting for God to create it, those things that go in it. God created the space. He called it Shema or Shemay. And then he created a landmass, a firmness, if you will, in that Shemay. And he called it Eretz, which is going to become our earth. But he goes on further. In verses uh, 1 and 2, uh, this is verse 2, he says, And the earth, that's the Eretz now, it's the same word, but notice the shift. Uh, he says, The earth was without form. It was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. <clears throat> this is the earth before it was complete. Uh, and what God says about it is that it was without form. 
<clears throat> the Hebrew word that is translated without form is is the word uh, to who. That, that, that sounds kind of funny, but T-O-H-U is the English spelling, and it's pronounced to who. And, and its meaning is rather simple. It means waste or desolation. More correctly, it's worthless. Uh, but the groundwork has been laid, and it will remedy that, or God will remedy that a little later. Not only was it worthless, it was without form, it was, it was desolate or waste. He also says it was void. Quite often when we encounter the word void, we, we think it's, it's of no use. Uh, but the actual Hebrew word that is translated void here is bahu. And it means that it was undistinguishable. Uh, the impression that we get uh, when both it, bahu, and tuhu, the first word that describe it, uh, the two words are related. And when you put them together, uh, it means it is undistinguishable. It's without form. You can't define anything in particular about it. Not only is it indistinguishable, without form, void, and barren, it's also darkness. And the Hebrew word there is kochek, if I'm right, if I'm pronouncing it right. And the meaning of that word is the dark. That is to say, it means there was absolutely no light. So even if you could have seen the world and distinguished something about it, it was so dark that you wouldn't have been able to see it anyway. Uh, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? What it means is there was just no way possible for that to be seen. And, of course, there was no one to see it yet either. God, of course, who is omniscient and all-powerful, he could see. And so, as is said, that the darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. Now, I find that real interesting because he says it was on the face of the deep. And again, the Hebrew word that is translated deep is mayim. And it means water. Or, more correctly, it means fluid of some sort. And so there in those first two verses, at the very beginning of creation, we find that God created from nothing a mass of fluid that is worthless and shapeless and indistinguishable, but it's there in the space that used to be nothing. What's going to happen is God is going to trans form that indistinguishable, shapeless nothing that's worthless into something that is perfect and beautiful. But we don't have time today to do that, so that will be in the next part. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good evening. Good night.